Welcome to the Bitcoin Aggregated Podcast. Um, <laughs> we've been meaning to do this for a while, haven't we, Chris? Like it's been sort of weeks. <laughs> we keep going, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And then I got COVID and it's just been crazy, but it's cool to actually kick it off. So we're going to try and do this as often as possible. And basically the concept is um, running through Bitcoin news, like what's what's been happening, what we're interested in, posting about it and then talking about it. Um, so if you go to BitcoinAggregator.com, there's an RSS feed you can follow along with and check out all the, the stuff we've been posting um, sort of throughout the week or um, this is going back a couple of months. So we've got a lot of, lot of content here. Um, one of the first ones uh, we wanted to kick off with, I think, was this tweet uh, that my six-year-old daughter gets her allowance in Bitcoin, her plan is to retire by 16. Now, the reason I posted that one um, as one of my friends actually in New Zealand, he um, has like a, a, a he's, he's got a plan to basically build a like a homestead sort of thing um, out of shipping containers in the middle of nowhere. Like it's pretty cool. Um, Sign me up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great idea. I, I love the idea of a shipping container house as well. Um, but he's been sort of saving in his bank account. And I'm like, oh, dude like saving <laughs> saving BTC right like before before it's too late um which he had been doing a portion of I was like oh that's really cool but in a custodial um account so like oh you need a hardware wallet ASAP and like get onto that um but in that conversation he was talking about his kids and how he's been trying to do financial literacy with them and um basically using some app that does like fiat so you can sort of break up like your your uh, allowance and then they can save some of it and right, right it sounds pretty cool i was like man do that but do it with satoshis like instead sort of thing and after that conversation i saw this tweet and i was like oh i gotta <laughs> gotta share that with him that's cool as well twitter algorithms on yeah. Point. yeah yeah i love just... that i mean it sounds like the daughter's probably being a little bit bearish if she's stacking Bitcoin at six with like <laughs> 10 years, she'll be, she could probably retire at 12 to be fair, but <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. And what, this is an idea that I've had for a couple of years, I think maybe. So when oh, we're from Australia, if it's not obvious by our accents, but <laughs> growing up, going to primary school when we were, you know, five, six, seven, eight, they had this program, um, from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia called the Dolomites program. And some people may remember that if, if they participated in it as well. Basically, it was there. It, look, it was to, to, not to give banks much credit, but um, it was actually a really clever program to get kids. You basically had these little booklets that had like deposit slips in it and your parents, that's it. Um, your parents could sort of give you change, like loose change and, you know, maybe a $5 note every week and you'd take it into the school, you'd put it in your little Dolomites pouch and then you'd make a deposit and it would go into your savings account. But basically it was their way to get people signed up to their bank. And to be fair, at least for me, it's worked because my personal accounts are still with ComBank to this oh, day. Wow. Um, so I've been a customer of theirs for, you know, 25 years because of the Dolomites program. But my idea essentially is instead of doing that with, you know, with spare, spare fiat change, which is the ultimate shitcoin, you do it with Satoshis. So you, your parents give you a little bit of Satoshi every week and you, you put that away, which is essentially what this um, Shane's daughter is doing by the sounds of it, yeah. um, which I think would be a, a great pivot. I mean, a bank's probably never going to do that, are they? But that would be a, a pretty cool pivot if they allowed for that to happen. So I've actually bought the domain satoshimite.com. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should start it. Uh, that was the idea. So I wanted to get something up and running before. So I'm presenting next week or the week after at um, this ComBank conference where they're actually putting on a Bitcoin conference. Like it's come full circle. It's so incredible. Like the major Wait, so it bank is a Bitcoin Australia. conference? Uh, it's a blockchain but right. like Bitcoin as part of it, it's still like, wow. It's uh, like, you know, for, for 10 years, I've been told it's no good and it's for criminals and, you know, everybody hates it. Like the fact that ComBank are putting on a conference for that and they're actually integrating like Bitcoin into their, their into app their apparently app. at some point. Well, I mean, they announced that a few months ago, but how long it takes to actually deliver yeah. that. 
Who I actually, actually signed up to Combank just to see. Like, oh, yeah. Was there, and I'm like, hmm, there's nothing there. So I would I got honestly a mess- be I got a surprised. Today, actually, and it said, like, if you don't put some money into your Combank account, gonna it's going it. to get cancelled. I'm like, <laughs> eh, oh, well, uh, whatever. Um, maybe I'll do that them as- too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we got to do that as part of my prayers. But um, no, I thought I'd buy satoshibite.com and get, like, something going before the prayers and say, look, much like he said, like, you know, there was this cool program called the Dolomite program that's been shut down. Rah, rah, rah. Why don't we do like a real one with real money? That'd be so much better than, you know, a Dolomite program with fake money. Like, makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe we should do it then. Like, yeah, man. I didn't, I didn't know you had the domain. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, I thought I told you. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh, you might have, but maybe I forgot. But that's yeah. so cool. I think we should do it. It'd be such a simple app too, right? Like, it would yeah. just be basically it's basically just like any other dollar cost averaging app parents can just drop in connect their bank account or their credit card or some some type of payment yeah rail and then just put in five bucks a week ten bucks a week for their kids gets thrown into bitcoin we do the i guess it would kind of be like a digital currency exchange at that point so we'd probably need to get some licensing and stuff but um that'd be a great idea and then i don't know we'd educate them about you know not your keys, not your coins and all that sort of stuff and get them hardware well, I was, wallets. I was and... thinking that as well. Like you do, I was thinking multi-sig, like with the parents and the, the kids. So they learn about that process as well. So like, uh, I'm of two minds of that because it's like, that's awesome, but a lot can go wrong. Whereas something like Wallet of Satoshi, that's quite simple. You use your email address to log in and then that's it. Might be the way to go as well. I don't know. Really have to yeah, think, think it through. Probably be some element of, custodianship which would be less than ideal but how cool would it be if like kids could log on to this app because i mean kids are on apps like the minute they come out of the womb these days mm. so like imagine they could come onto this app this satoshi Mart app and like once a week they could do some sort of financial literacy module yeah. where they learn a little bit about bitcoin they learn a little bit about how money works and then from that they get a little bit of satoshi thrown yeah. into their wallet yeah exactly. that would be so bloody cool yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's kind of the concept we had initially for the School of Bitcoin, um, where it's like, you know, like, I think it was like what we came up with years ago, um, similar sort of model with the, the NEM system we were going to build out, like, to pay students to sort of learn. But with the School of Bitcoin, it's specifically for financial literacy, and we're replacing, it was actually uh, one, of the, one of the devs from Chicago, really cool guy, uh, it was his idea to do, like, I don't know if you've done like a MOOC before. Uh, but a MOOC's basically like a massive online open course where you can go and sit whatever from Harvard or like whatever university. And if you fail, whatevs, if you pass, then you actually pay for your cert. And they're not that expensive. They're like, you know, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, and you're certified from them. So like, well, why don't we do that and do it with an NFT? Um, NFT on stacks, like built on the BTC blockchain specifically. And then that sort of funds the program as opposed to sort of paying it somebody every time that they do something in the network. Um, and that's kind of where we're at with that. But I think, I think that the sort of pay to, to learn model is definitely, definitely key. So yeah, it's um, one of the projects I want to do as part of that is Satoshi, Satoshi might. So See, I'll get, yeah, I'll get I mean, something up so and running cool. beforehand. To be honest, like, I don't think we would have too much trouble finding people to like, donate bitcoin to this type of thing like there'd be yeah. a bunch of philanthropists out there that just have too many corns that'd be like <laughs> sweet you know like no such you know, thing. We're giving, <laughs> yeah <laughs> like we're, we're giving i mean like you you, you did with, the, with your school at we a park right you got donated 21 bitcoin some time ago yeah similar type thing would need 21 bitcoin obviously it would just be satoshis but yeah. like i mean i i donate to it yeah yeah a, so- por- a portion of my stack and like, I'm sure there'd be other people out there. Go, I mean, this is an important thing to do. Like, try to educate the next generation of kids about sound money principles. Like all the things that we never got when we went to school and yeah. when we were growing up. Right? It yeah. took me until I turned 25, 26, to yeah. I started really questioning these things and learning about it. And obviously, I wish I knew sooner because I'd be much further ahead. But you know, if we can teach these kids, especially when their brains are like sponges, um, uh, it's just I love it. You know, that's a great idea. But <laughs> what what was the thing that that sort of uh, sparked your interest in in thinking about how money works and and like what it is initially, like at twenty five or whatever it was? 
I'm not sure to be honest, because like I, I learned about Bitcoin in 2011, 2012, but mm -hmm. I had the kind of classic story that most people um, who got into Bitcoin at that time, it was, you know, through through the dark net markets and experimenting <laughs> with Tor and just I, I had I didn't read the white paper, you know, like I wish I did. And that's one of my big regrets was I got into Bitcoin, but it was nearly just this fake Internet money thing. I wish I really mm. read the white paper and understood the concepts of it. I've always yeah. been an inquisitive mind. And, and so I've always questioned things and tried to find the truth myself. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite understand it or didn't get inquis inquisitive enough back then when I should have. It yeah. wasn't until about 2015 where I kind of circled back to Bitcoin and was like, oh, this thing's still around. And it's actually kind of grown a bit more than what it was five years ago. And, you know, it's not just for criminals and, and drug dealers <laughs> and stuff like that now, like, like it was in 2011, 2012. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's what set me on the actual path of then starting to question like, well, what is, I read the white paper. So that was mm. a big one. Like where I was like, oh, holy shit. Like, okay, wow. There's a lot more to this than what I thought. Um, and that's kind of what set me on the path. Then my mind sort of went wild as it does when I get interested in the topic. It's just like, oh, well now I need to learn everything. How yeah. does this work? Why, do, why is it important? And then I start questioning like, well, wait a minute, I don't actually understand how money works. Like I understand Bitcoin sounds really cool, but what's the problem it's fixing? And so then I had to go back and fill in those knowledge gaps of, you know, why the financial system's broken, how we got to where we got to today. And I'm still learning. Like it's, it's, a, it's an ever, ever present thing. Oh, yeah. But um, it's, and it's yeah, always I, exciting. I, I don't teach you this stuff in school. I, I think that's sort of by design because they don't want people poking too many holes in in what is already you know a very broken system if, if everyone really <laughs> truly understood how money worked where it came from who creates it who controls it then i think we'd we'd see a lot more people on the streets yelling and we'd see a lot more bitcoin adoption and and those sorts of things for but, sure yeah 100 um, that time's coming you know like you just look around at countries in the world with hyperinflation going absolutely wild that's going to happen with every fiat currency i mean it's happened to date through human history, there's there's no reason why, you know, today is any different. You know, the Australian dollar or the US dollar or the Canadian dollar or the yen, like these are not suddenly immune to the same faults that every other fiat currency in human history has fall uh, was succumbed to essentially. So yeah. Um, yeah. it's not it's not a matter of sort of if, it's a matter of when. Hundred percent. And it uh, it just sucks. I can sort of see the future and Australia is going to be like one of the last places mm -hmm. for, for the adoption just because so like so many people here are like dumb, fat and happy and they just don't want to have to think about anything. Right. Like it's a, it's like, it's somebody else's problem, like overseas, whatever, like, and yeah, it doesn't see, feel real yet. You know, like for yeah. the most part as broken as our system is here in Australia, our economy works, yeah. you know, like most people can get access to financial services. I mean, yeah, some, throughout recent history they walk into a bank and they literally throw home lo home loans at you yeah so like we're not like say el salvador which is a great example of a country that is highly underbanked yeah. i think i read a statistic from a podcast i listened to um just the other day and it was like over 40 years uh the traditional banking system in el salvador only banks like two million people or something like that out of seven or eight million however many people live in El Salvador. Yeah, so over right. four decades, they, they got 2 million people banked. And even that is probably severely underbanked. Yeah. It's probably like the very basics of banking services. Over a 90 day period since they made Bitcoin legal tender, they got 3 million people signed up to Bitcoin and even gave them $30 worth of Bitcoin to get yeah. started. So it's in incredible. 90 days, they, yeah. they banked more people than what the traditional banking system did over the course of four decades. You know, unbelievable statistic, right? Yeah. But benevolent, you know, that benevolent dictator. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, think of what you think want to think of Bukele and, and whatnot, but I reckon he's awesome. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't live there. I've been there yeah. and, and yeah. it's an amazing place, but it's obviously different when you live there and there's, there's other issues, yeah. not just Bitcoin, yeah. uh, but his, his stance on that is at least something that I can align with. Um, the rest of his policies, I obviously don't know because they don't affect me directly. Yeah, I've only seen him like wearing a backwards hat and tweeting and being cool. 
but yeah, God, he looks God knows really cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he, like he threw a party to announce the the Bitcoin City, and and I was lucky enough to get an invite, a presidential That's so invite, cool. which is really wow. cool. And you know, he was there on. It was like a it was like a rock star. You know, he was like there on stage. He's young. He's good public speaker. He like connects with me, and I'm not even from the damn country. Like you know, it's yeah, yeah it's really cool. But to your point, yeah, I agree. Like Australia is kind of got they're one of those countries that have the most to lose because we're so ingrained in the, in the traditional fiat system. Whereas El Salvador is not really like, they don't even have their own currency. They don't even set their own monetary policy. So for them, it's not that big of a risk to go, well, let's just give Bitcoin a go. Whereas with Australia, it probably is a big, big of a risk. And there's probably less to gain at least in the immediate future. Whereas that statistic I said, you know, 3 million people banked in three in, uh, in three months, you know, that's an, um, that's an extraordinary amount. It's incredible. Of, it's it's incredible. incredible. But like yeah. if the same thing percentage wise happened in Australia, it wouldn't really change that much. Like everyone is pretty much banked here already. So, yeah. yeah. but when shit turns and like I said, it will, you know, that's when we're going to hope we're going to wish that we probably were a bit more proactive with Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Like, I mean, even, even years ago, I was like, um, I was like actively campaigning to to get like retail stores just to accept BTC. I'm like it costs you nothing. I was going around like with flyers and stuff, like trying to just get like the local community on board, and nobody wants a bar of it. I got like <clears throat> was one coffee place when I was living in Mordialic. Um, guy opens up, and I actually set him up with Walter Satoshi. So this is like a couple of years ago, and um, actually it was it was the start of the pandemic, and he like bought a business <laughs> for, I, I knew the lady who like owned the business before she's like i'm getting out this is this is not going to be good sold <laughs> it to this dude and i was like oh i felt kind of sorry for him I'm like oh man this is like things are not going to be good you know like I had a chat with him blah blah blah. i'm like have you heard about like bitcoin he's like oh yeah something in the news i'm like oh check this out so i set him up with the world of satoshi like sent him some sats i'm like that's free like from you to me there's no middleman like you know how you pay ANZ like for that that um like setup that you have and they take a cut every time there's none of that with that it's just straight to you he's like oh that's awesome so I bought like a coffee went back bought another coffee off him I'm like oh this is great next week went back and he's like oh my wife said she doesn't like it uh (laughs) I can't do that anymore. I'm like, oh, wow, dude. And I had looked, I was like, oh, well, look, let's, I'll back your wallet up for you. So I sign in and stuff. It had gone up like a bunch since I like gave it to him. I'm like, would you not want that? Like money going up instead of down in value? He's like, yeah. But my wife said she doesn't like it. So I'm like, that's it. Like, cool. <laughs> like, wow. Well, I can tell you she's going to regret that decision at some point in the future <laughs> if she doesn't already. Yeah. I think yeah. Uh, there's a nice little segue here to another tweet that's that's on that page from yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the documenting Bitcoin one of kind of the the narrative and you see the, the way that it's shifted over the years. Like, you know, 2010, mm. a Bitcoin. 2011, mm-hmm. no one uses it. <laughs> 2012, only a few geeks use it. 14, only a few criminals, only a few libertarians, only a few people. You know, now what we're saying is only a few companies, only a few countries, countries use it. Like, yeah. like at what point will people wake up and realize that this thing's here to stay no matter who says that it's not or tries to stop it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like what's that, what, you know, what are we going to be saying next year? Uh, only a few continents use it. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Well, it's like, it's going to be all of Africa, right? Cause they've um, got like 2030 or only earth uses it. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mars doesn't use it yet. Mars uses Dogecoin cause Elon <laughs> likes it. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's so true. It's crazy, huh? Um, all right, let's let's have us. I've got so much posted on here, so we should have a squeeze through and see what sort of jumps out. <clears throat> uh, that was an interesting one. Getting a, a Bitcoin job and like why it's important. I think it's a bit of a long article though, so we might not go into the. Central I mean, there's Africa. definitely lost of statistics talking about how like this particular industry has so many job opportunities yeah and like the, i think the good thing about it is i can only speak from my small lens and my professional experience of about six years working in the industry but you know i don't have 
a, a graduate's degree. I, I dropped out of university when I couldn't be bothered being a coder because I didn't like coding. But you know, <laughs> I still I still found myself well positioned in an industry that I had essentially no experience in. And I think that is a bit of a theme throughout the Bitcoin industry is that it's not necessarily about what that piece of paper says. It's more about your energy, your desire, your willingness to learn, all of those other qualities that make a good employee as opposed to, oh yeah, you've got six years experience working in sales and you've got yeah. a bachelor's degree. Like to me, you know, I, I made a rule a few years ago, well, basically when I, when I started CoinStop six years ago, it was like, you know, I'm never doing resumes again. Yeah. I just let my body of work speak. And if you don't think my body of work is interesting and the way that I conduct myself and we can, I'm happy to do interviews and speak to people, but at the end of the day, I can write anything on a piece of paper. It, it really mm -hmm. doesn't matter. It, it, what matters is how I apply myself and, and, and whether I'm willing to learn. I mean, skills are just skills. Like no one's born computer scientist no one is born a carpenter these are all things that you learn over time and if you've got the right mindset and the right drive and willingness you can learn all these things so you know yeah. there's probably people out there going like how do i get into this thing like i don't know where to start and like literally the way i got into it is i just hung out in bitcoin communities and hassled bitcoin businesses until they gave me a job i just hung yeah. around i just you know made myself a fly on the wall until they said like, dude, you hang out here so much. Do you want to just come work for us? <laughs> and that's literally how I got my first job at a, at a crypto exchange back in 2016 was just, I just hung oh, around uh, there. What, what was the exchange? I mean, it's not one that I'm overly proud of in, in hindsight because they've since done a rug pull and basically, oh, no. <laughs> basically scammed everyone. But back then in 2016, they were the largest exchange by trading volume in Australia, which is ACX. ACX but, yeah, right. <laughs> but they've got some pretty... Okay pretty uh pretty interesting characters that that were running that business and they kind of <laughs> had a thankfully i was well gone you know i was only there for a few months um kind of at the, at the peak of the sort of 2017 bull market where you know there weren't that many exchanges around and they were doing millions and millions of dollars a day which was huge for australia back then like nowadays yeah. we've got over 200 different exchanges and they're doing hundreds of millions of dollars and you know the market's obviously much much bigger than what it was five years ago but yeah, like that's literally my inception of how I got into the space. I just hung wow. out at a Bitcoin meetup, kept talking to people, kept hassling people to give me a job, give me an opportunity. And that's once you got the foot in the door, then that's, that you, you know, as, as long as you apply yourself, you can just keep progressing. <laughs> Shout out to Sam, eh? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't dare, wouldn't dare kind of interact or, or, you know, sort of work with, <laughs> work him with again. them again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no chance. No chance. But that being said though, like, it, like we've said this in the past, like that, that the Bitcoin center Melbourne was, it was the epicenter of Bitcoin. Like I, I went, 100%. I went to the, to the one in New York and it wasn't half as cool as the space that we had here at the time. Like it was so amazing. Some and of I the think, most fun I've had for yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think we all kind of took it for granted a little bit at the time. Well, I didn't. I was like, oh my God, I'm, this is incredible. I don't think. Well, they had a lot of politicians through to come check out the space, and none of them could, like, there was no backing. There was, I'm like, this is amazing. Like, you should well, be. I mean, it's still a struggle now, and we're six years on. I know, Imagine I know. what it would have been like back then. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was ridiculous, but it was still like, you, you would think there'd be some sort of like help with building such an innovative space and having like the Bitcoin center in the world, but it just uh, didn't, didn't work out that way, I suppose, which kind of sucks. Um, I suppose the, yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's have a squeeze. What else have we got here? That was an interesting one. Like the uh, Ross Ulbricht. So his whole story, uh, I was listening to a podcast on that recently, that poor guy <laughs> I feel so bad for him. Like, Oh man, free Ross dude it's it's crazy like i don't know if you follow his twitter and stuff but he was like he i don't know how he tweets out but he, he tweets out like really meaningful stuff and uh he's been doing like artwork from from prison as well and turning them into nfts and and whatever but his um yeah his debt's gone from the the seizures which is a positive i suppose but uh, it's just it's so heartbreaking to particularly when you like listen to his Wait, mom who is and he stuff. in debt to uh so i i think in debt to the government like for the amount of like legal fees and stuff so oh, um, right. that's been sort of the the slate's been wiped clean for that so maybe it's something 
um, moving forward where it, it, it could potentially mean he sort of gets out. But listening to his mom and stuff, it's like, oh, my God, that's so heartbreaking. And even, even like, going back in time, I remember, I remember listening to, like, it was, like, a police commissioner who was on a podcast talking about, like, the difference between, like, uh, pre-Silk Road and post-Silk Road where it was like really dangerous for, you know, drug addicts and, um, and criminals basically. Um, Cause they'd have to go into like dangerous neighborhoods and stuff. And he was like, this kid made this website and like literally saved people's lives who would have had to put themselves in these dangerous situations. And he saw like firsthand how much better it was sort of thing. Um, and he was just like, just made a website. It's, it's crazy. It's like, it's akin to making, you know, like a torrent site or something and go on a jail for that because, you know, other people have used your platform to exchange data. Like it's just... Well, I mean, Kim.com is probably a good example of... Yes. Whilst yeah, yeah. he's not in jail, they've, they've certainly, you know, tried tried a bunch of different things to, to get him locked up and whatnot, given his involvement with Mega Upload and whatnot. But yeah i i just feel so wrong but you know obviously they they did it because they wanted to make a big example of of ross and to try to stop imitators which obviously hasn't worked because yeah it's just exploded of course, of course i mean there's there's that many marketplaces i mean it's not something i look at these days but um there's tens of marketplaces if not hundreds of marketplaces out there still working on tour and still probably providing the same type of services and products to people all around the world. So yeah. they stopped Ross, but it's just the next, the next person pops up and they do the next, the same thing, you know? Like Yeah, exactly. And it, I mean, it's not to say that like, you know, the people selling stuff on there are good people or anything. It's just the fact that he created a, like a, a system so that <clears throat> people didn't have to put themselves in danger. That's all he did. It wasn't like he wasn't really making much money from the looks of it off of like transactions and that sort of thing. He like was just, I've got this idea. I want to build that. And then there's a whole talk I wanted and stuff, but it's <coughs> quite sad, really. There's but, a really um, good, there's a really good podcast that I listen to every now and then called, oh, geez, oh, surely I can think of it. Um, Darknet Diaries. I don't know if oh, you've yes. ever listened to Darknet yeah. Diaries, but Fantastic. there's a good three part series on Silk Road and Ross Ulbrick and all that. So like if anyone hasn't kind of got the overview of what actually happened with Ross and Silk Road, I would recommend that Darknet Diaries. I mean, it's just a great podcast about all different things on the internet and uh, social engineering. It's, it's a, it's a while ago. You've got to scroll back, you know, yeah. back to the early catalog, but I think it's a three part series. Um, it really, really good. Like one of the best sort of summarizations of what happened with Silk Road and, and Ross and all that sort of stuff. It's yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Indeed. Um, all righty. Let's have a squeeze here. Oh, that was one <laughs> I posted. I thought that was relevant to the, they're talking at the hey, um, Bitcoin ahead. conference everyone. about, um, about making some money. generating alpha. Generating alpha <laughs> so bad. alpha being like the, the alpha, um, investment being btc i'm like oh that's awesome that's our name for a company that's that's a great <laughs> um worth having a look at anyway but we'll uh we'll, we'll save the alpha stuff till till the next podcast i suppose um just going through here let's see <laughs> i did like i did Sailor like yeah. kills it doesn't it? <laughs> i mean yeah sailor sailor's a great spokesperson for bitcoin having <laughs> done a complete 180 considering his previous position on it but I, yeah. I i found that particular tweet quite interesting so like bitcoin is not about moving one billion dollars from here to tokyo it's about moving one billion dollars from here to the year 2140 so the way that i understood that and i don't know if this is the way that sailor kind of meant it or how other people understood it was more about like the store of value element and the fact that you aren't moving it across just space, but you're moving it across space and time. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that fiat currencies can't do very well. I mean, yeah. they can't really move, move it across space very well either. No, it takes no. days, Terrible. Um, especially if it's physical cash, it's even longer. Yep. But that was my kind of my take taking from it was like, Bitcoin will be the same 
in 2140 as it will be today. And yeah. that, that assurance through the protocol and the code is something that we can't really get with, with essentially much else. I mean, maybe, no, maybe well, gold to an extent. Well, not, not really, because you can't move it from here to Tokyo the same way you could. Like, in terms of moving it across time, it probably does a better job than what Fiat does. But yeah, I agree. Moving it across mm. space, gold is exceptionally cumbersome. It's crap. <laughs> it really is. Crap is another way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, but I mean, he's just so articulate. I could listen to him like for hours on PTC. And like you said, like the fact that he did, like a, a, he really flipped like his whole thinking and was like, I really respect anyone who's intelligent enough to say I was wrong. So Great. like, like, like Peter Schiff, for example, is. He is, can't, he can't say he well, was wrong. <laughs> but he, but he's so disingenuous because he can clear, like he gets flooded with information. His son is tweeting all the time saying like, dad's an idiot. Like this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, dude, why don't you just embrace it and say, look, I was completely wrong. I can see that. But I think he's just got his. He's just he's just put his his feet in the sand and he's like, no, nah, this is it. I'm I'm sticking with that. Whereas Sailor, he was like, oh no, I was I looked at it, I didn't get it. I thought it was magic internet money, rah rah rah. Yeah. This this is this is the future. And he just I actually I actually like Peter Schiff, to be honest, it, which is really weird because he's like incredibly wrong about Bitcoin. Like yeah. exceptionally wrong. Like we see the same problems. He just has like a different solution, which yeah. is gold. And yeah. I understand he's like in heavily invested into gold, yeah. Both from like a business perspective and probably from his personal well, portfolio as well. If you, if you look well. at like his solution to that, so if you remember, he he had that that uh, platform set up with like it was like a gold credit card, and you can load up your credit card with gold through his company. I'm like, that sounds like a central bank. Like you're recreating the same problems of the past. Like. What are you doing, dude? Like you, you come out and you you talk. It it he does a good game like against the Federal Reserve and central banking. And blah, blah, yeah, he like, gets all the problems. That's yeah. that's why I like him because he can articulate a lot of the issues really, really well, and he understands. Yeah, like the economics behind a lot of things. Well, he just he's so wrong about Bitcoin. He's got a blind spot. It's is bizarre. he like yeah? Is he just dumb or is he doing it like on purpose because? he's too invested or, you know, he's got to dig his, but even the, but sand, he, it's but... been so long. It's been years. Like cars was, we should, him, we should make a website bed. that has like the flipping between um, Peter yeah. and his son, Spencer. So when Spencer's <laughs> Bitcoin portfolio flips, his like dad's gold portfolio, like that's yeah, the flipping. <laughs> the flipping. That's the flipping. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool. Um, this is what I wanted to talk about actually. So I don't know. Have you looked at submarine swaps at all? No, I really don't know much about it, but I have heard of heard of it. So the idea, and this is something that I thought was was pretty cool, because like you know that the whole concept of uh, BTC being like the main chain, or this is how I think of it anyway, and then like all these other alts, particularly proof of work alts, um, that are sort of building, and then later on they could be rolled into the main chain being BTC. So like there's a few. Uh, few projects I like, like Handshake, I think is fantastic, where they're basically decentralizing um, uh, like a DNS and and uh, domain names, taking away from the centralized authority of ICANN, using proof of work to do that. So literally like a fork of BTC to, to build that out. And I think down the track, we could just roll that into BTC and say, look, this is what this is what we're using now, right? Like the it's... like on a later layer or something like that, like on yeah, a layer two, yeah. layer well, three solution type well, thing. Well, or... I think even even just put them onto the BTC blockchain eventually. So it's like th this is what we have up up until this point. Cut it off. We can put it into BTC. Kill kill the old old chain sort of thing. As um, in, like put it into the actual blocks of BTC. Yeah, wouldn't, yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Would that not be bad for it's bloat? just names? Like it's not they're not big, you know what I mean? Like yeah. so that's like the, the same as like uh like Namecoin tried to do initially, which I thought was a cool project, that they just implemented everything wrong. These guys <laughs> have kind of fixed everything with that and they've done it really in, in a smart way. But um, 
with that, I was thinking, well, there isn't really many examples yet where that's kind of been done. LBR Y is another one, which I, I really like, where it's basically like YouTube on a proof of work blockchain, which is literally a fork of BTC, um, which I think later on we could probably roll into BTC as well. <clears throat> Monero has always been a project that I like for fungibility, obviously. So, you, you know, you, you're not, you're not, um, you don't have certain coins that are, uh, have different value to other coins based on where they come from and rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Um, and this is literally that. So it's like submarine swaps. Basically, it takes a transaction, moves it from on-chain to a lightning um, transaction, which is totally decentralized and you you don't know where it's coming from, and then vice versa back on-chain. You can do both. I'm like, well, that's basically... Monero, like they've kind of built it, maybe without realizing what they're building, but so is it like a coin join type mixing service? No, no, it's not mixing anything. So basically, with the Lightning Network, because it's so decentralized, um, it already really obfuscates like where transactions are coming from and where they're going. Yeah, <clears throat> based on the channels, right? So the more channels there are, the, the harder it is to actually figure out what stuff's going. So like hence you have more fungibility on the Lightning Network than you do on chain. But all it's doing is basically swapping. So from on chain transaction, so somebody else doing the transaction for you on Lightning or vice versa. So it means like it doesn't matter either way. Like you're, all right, I'm, I want to send you some, some BTC and I want to do it on chain. These guys will do it for me in the background. Uh, or like whoever's running submarine swap, it's just open code. Like we could run our own submarine swap service if we wanted to. Um, I thought that's so cool. Like the fact that they've maybe not even addressed that, like the fungibility thing as a problem. It was just like a cool thing they've developed. I'm like, that's basically what Monero is. And it's been rolled into BTC. So I can see in weird ways, we're going to have all these different chains sort of rolled into it um, at some stage, I think anyway. Maybe not Ethereum, but, <laughs> but yeah, we'll and I mean that's kind of my thesis as well. Is like anything that turns out to be useful that comes through crypto, I think will eventually be rolled back into Bitcoin at some chain. later date. Yeah, come back yeah. to Bitcoin. I mean, everything else is just like a shitcoin test net for experimenting and figuring out like. Is there value here? Do people want this particular solution? If they do, it'll be built on Bitcoin or it'll be rolled back into Bitcoin at a later date. Yeah. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I haven't it's seen that. <laughs> Electricity. Bitcoin mining destroys the planet, <laughs> but charging cars saves the planet? Whoa. I don't know. Do you, do you, we probably don't have it here in front of us, but a quick Google search would probably be able to find it. But do you remember the, the tweet, the famous tweet from the World Economic Forum? I think it was in 2017, where they said by the year 2020, all of, I'm pretty sure they say all of, uh, sorry, Bitcoin mining will consume all power or all energy in the world. <laughs> I didn't see that. I'm pretty sure you could, you, you should be able to Google this. It's like a pretty, pretty famous like tweet um, from, I think it's 2017. That might be yeah, it there, the second link. Yeah. Have a look at that one. I reckon that one might be it. it 2020 Bitcoin. There, there you go. That's it. Wow. Close enough. I, I paraphrase. I was a little bit wrong. No, but, I think, I think um, you're right with the tweet. But, you know, this is 2017. Yeah. It's now obviously five years later. And what a joke. Are they I for mean, real? Bitcoin uses very, very little considering of like the world's energy generation. I was listening to another podcast. It's the same podcast, actually. I listened to it uh, yesterday. Um, so it's fresh in the mind. It's uh, what Bitcoin did podcast with, oh, geez, what's the guy's name? I sent it to you last night, Kieran. Um, uh, Let's have a look. I've never even heard of the guy before. Apparently he's only ever done like a couple of podcasts. Um, like this was his first in-person podcast ever. Uh, like Alice, where is he? That guy there, Darren Feinstein. 
So he he's I would recommend anyone to go listen. Yeah, he comes from like an accounting lawyer lawyer type background. So he he looks at Bitcoin through a slightly different lens to what maybe perhaps the majority of people might do. But yeah. um sort of second half of the podcast, they get started talking about like energy and Bitcoin mining. So he runs this big Bitcoin mining company and they put a bunch of data centers up all around America. I think they have in six different states. They essentially produce about 3% of the daily block rewards. So of 900 Bitcoin that gets mined every day, they're getting about 35 or something. So, you know, Jesus. it's pretty, pretty yeah. significant amount of hash rate. These guys are, are, are pumping out, but um, you know, I might be getting these numbers wrong, but he was talking about how, you know, the, the world produces something like, I think it was either 160,000 or 260,000 tera hashes or whatever the measurement was. Uh, I can't, can't remember exactly, but, you know, it was like hundreds of thousands of this of this unit mm. uh, worth of worth of energy generation, and Bitcoin consumes two hundred two zero zero. <laughs> so, it, it, like, bugger all in the in the global scheme of things. And he was basically trying to counter the fud of oh, Bitcoin uses the equivalent energy of, of a small New Zealand, country. Yeah, 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 or, yeah, yeah. yeah, or Switzerland, or some some you know, choose your small country of choice. Yeah. You know, because that's such a shocking thing to hear like oh wait yeah. a minute like how can it use as much as new zealand like that's a that's a proper country that has yeah. people in it you know and you're telling me this network <laughs> uses as much as that like oh, yeah that's we can't stand for that but the yeah. reality of that is it doesn't use nearly anything what that makes it seem like it uses 200 out of 200,000 whatever hashes of energy um the unit measurement is and like to and he he mentions this in the in the podcast like to companies like BP or Exxon, like any of these big power generation companies, that's literally a rounding error, like 200 yeah. compared yeah, yeah, to yeah. the thousands or tens of thousands <laughs> that these companies produce, like 200 is a rounding error. So Bitcoin yeah. is a rounding error of the world's capacity. It's just like, come on, the FUD is ridiculous. It's so, so. It's funny. insane. Well, and, and the, the, like Sailor talks about, like it's, yeah, whatever it uses, it doesn't waste one bit of energy. So in people's minds, like they, they think, oh, well, that's just computers doing nothing. Like they're just whirring away, you know, causing noise pollution and causing um, like draining energy for no reason. No, they're securing the network. So if you look at the, the hash rate, like we're at a sort of whole time high, I think. Yeah. Um, not one bit of that is wasted. It's like even backtracking on that, that like the, or, or trying to combat that narrative with like, oh, it doesn't use that much, I promise. And it's mostly green and all that. It's like, well, hang on. None of it's wasted. That's the point, right? Like that, we need to sort of go back on the uh, offensive with that and say like, well, if, if your idea of, of energy being wasted is securing the most important network in the world. Like then what's, where's your mindset? Like it doesn't yeah, make any What's sense. everything else doing then? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like the, the analogy to like Christmas trees, lights and stuff. It's like, yeah, great. That's a, that's a waste of energy. Uh, this doesn't, has never wasted anything. And the fact that it's like, just keeps going up and up. Like I know you're, um, I know you're not looking at the BTC for, oh no, we're maybe not quite at the high. Oh, I think we got there. I think we hit okay. 220 or nearly 220. There you go, 227. What were we at before? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Um, yeah, but the like the fact that you're not looking at price and stuff, which I love, it's awesome because price and fiat is just madness. Like, who cares? Anytime somebody tweets about the price, like going down or up or whatever, I just keep coming back to this hey we're at an all-time yeah. high again <laughs> people are like oh what do you mean like it's crazy it really really gets people thinking um, i mean day 129 today of not checking the price of bitcoin good work good work indeed yeah. i think i haven't even checked how many days i've been in for about 10 or 15 days because i've just been so busy and other things have been happening yeah, at the yeah, moment. yeah. so right now is the first time i checked 100 nearly 130 days so i think wow. the year's going to be easy like yeah I, to be honest, like it's not as if I'm going to hit January first, 2023, and then I'm going to like quickly jump onto Coin Market Cap and get my fix. You know, 
I actually think I'll just keep going. Like my, my time preference is so low that it, it honestly doesn't probably matter what the price of Bitcoin is until after 2030. Like Go on I another just 700 live. days, man. <laughs> At least. What's that? To, uh, to the Bitcoin days. halvening? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. do it. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, I, I probably could, to be honest. I probably could. Why not? I think that's the way to go. All right. Should we leave leave this podcast here and sort of switch gears into to alpha? I think we should. Yeah, let's let's do it. I think we covered a few a few topics and we'll, we'll do it again next week and whatever the whatever the latest news is next week, we'll pick it up. Come back, come back to that. Awesome. All right, thanks for listening, guys. Um, yeah, jump onto bitcoinaggregator.com. Um, feel free to, to uh, submit stuff if you want or just follow along with the RSS feed. Um, we're constantly posting stuff that you can check out. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll leave it at there. See you next week. See you, everyone. Adios. Nice, that was fun. Uh,